Hey, everybody, it's Reggie with Lawyer Interviews. And today we are talking with Kyle Newman, who is an attorney out of New York City. Hi, Kyle. How are you? I'm doing great, Reggie. How are you doing? Very well, thanks. And now, Kyle, you practice catastrophic injury, medical malpractice, and wrongful death. And you've done so for about 13 years, correct? Yes, that is correct. Very cool. Well, you and I had a little chat beforehand uh, about your practice and how you kind of fell into it. But I'd love you to share for our viewers how you decided to go the route of, you know, medical injury and what that looked like for you. Sure. So uh, I have a little bit of a unique, you know, uh, I guess, upbringing in my professional practice. Uh, after law school, uh, I had the opportunity to work at the, uh, continue working at the Suffolk County uh, DA's office where I, I worked in, in law school. But uh, my dad is a solo, pra- was a set solo practitioner at the time, um, had a very successful personal injury practice in the Bronx. Um, I'm actually a third generation per, uh, personal injury attorney. My grandfather is, is a PI attorney also. He's like that's old so school. Cool. Uh, New York, <laughs> Three generations. Down. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's where my dad, it's my mom's dad. That's where my dad first, you know, got his start. Mm-hmm. So anyway, so after law school, my dad wanted me to start working for him. Uh, and right off the bat, literally two weeks in was my first trial. Uh, and it's, it was really a testament to him having so much faith in me not knowing what the hell I was doing, you know, for a good long while. Yeah. I still don't half the time, but you know, um, uh, that was the most important thing. Just getting experienced in court, um, you know, trying case after case, being in front of juries, just being out there, um, you know, was the best possible thing. And when I started practicing, we had a handful of medical malpractice cases that my dad would really farm out. Uh, and I took a liking to it. And for whatever reason, medicine just clicks with me. It's something that I absolutely am fascinated by and, and just love. Um, mm-hmm. I love learning about it. I love the variety in the cases. Uh, and we were talking before that each you know, medical malpractice case is really a big puzzle that you have to put together to kind of decipher it. Um, in a way that's easy to digest and easy to understand, because these cases can be extremely complex. Uh, You're talking thousands, if not tens of thousands of pages of medical records, and you're dealing in in the personal injury world, the defense bar, as far as medical malpractice attorneys go, in my experience, are by far the finest defense attorneys that you will meet that are solely devoted to medical malpractice. I mean, in, in New York, there are some huge firms with excellent uh, trial attorneys. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think for me, uh, one of the things that um, kind of always worked as at you know as an advantage for me was being so young. Mm-hmm. And every trial that I, a big trial, big little or in between, I was always the youngest person by far, 10, 20, 30 years younger than the you know the big you know, big swing in, you know, uh, defense partner. The old um, white hair guys. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. White hair, you know, the professorial type that right. look, look at me and they think that they're going to get over easy, right. which, you know, for the young lawyers out there to get as much experience as possible and kind of use your youth as an advantage, because when you have an adversary that sees someone that's younger and less experienced, they're going to put their guard down Mm -hmm. and maybe not work as hard, take you as seriously. And the second that opening statement starts, you know, you want to knock their, their freaking socks off. Right. Um, Right. So that's something I kind of always have prided myself on, especially in the, you know, these are such adversarial cases and I've had so many intense battles with unbelievable attorneys Mm -hmm. Um, and I've been very, very fortunate in in my medical malpractice work, um, especially at trial. Very cool. And how do you feel as a smaller practitioner going up against bigger firms? That's a question that, you know, I get sometimes and other, you know, attorneys get, do you ever feel like it's an uneven match or do you actually feel that maybe you're more prepared for cases because you're in a smaller firm? You know, um, the the issue of youth is is just one thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I find that um, first of all, personal injury practice is so great. It, it really it's the David and Goliath every case because you don't have to be the biggest firm or have you know endless resources to do great in court and build a great case. Right. You just have to have the really the right systems and the right support uh, to do it. And really, in medical malpractice, we always say 
you got to know the case right in the beginning. You have to have your expert on board. You have to have your theories really, you know, pretty much set in the very, very beginning. And the most important thing with MedMal is to reject cases that may seem like it should be a case. Maybe there's a bad injury, but if I can't get my expert on board right away, and I'm fortunate, I work with a great, a, a few uh, uh, expert consulting services. Mm -hmm. The one that I love is GuidePoint. They've been phenomenal for the past few years. Um, uh, but, you know, working with a team like that, having the doctors teach me if it's something that I don't know. Um, and like anything, the more you do medical malpractice work, the more you're going to understand about medical records and different issues. One other thing that I would always say, and I see this happen a lot with other attorneys, is they take what the client is telling them as kind of like the Bible of the case and not focusing enough on what the medical records show right. and what the expert finds. Mm -hmm. And then people get caught, they just kind of believe what, what the client is telling them, which is, it, it, which is fine, mm -hmm. but you have to also confirm and, and make sure that it's, you know, you're locked in as far as your expert and what the actual records say, because the records are the Bible of the case. Right. I mean, how much of medical malpractice, for instance, is a battle of the experts? Uh, is a lot of the jury determination come down to which expert is more believable? Or is it also, you know, client's story? Is it a fair mix? Sure. Experts, witnesses, bad judge, bad jury, that can all lose you a case. But no one wins the case except the trial attorney. Right. You are the one that either wins or loses the case, no one else. Mm -hmm. So it's on you. That's my rule. I right. can beat anyone. I can win any case, but it's on me. Um, I don't let, you, you know, um, uh, and also, you know, trials are a, a big time roller coaster. Yes. Um, you could feel like you're on top of the world one day, unstoppable. And then the next day, holy shit, I just got destroyed. <laughs> by the, this doctor or, or expert. And you have to be really careful, especially when you have witnesses who are doctors, who are going to know far more medicine than I would ever know. Right. And not to get trapped or kind of pigeonhole yourself into a position where they can then take control and dominate. So you really have to pick and choose your battles, but the trial lawyer wins the case. That's it. Absolutely. I There's a really interesting saying that my boss taught me you know, years ago in litigation. He's like, during trial in the, you know, in the courtroom while the jury's there, it's the only place on earth that gravity decides not to work because okay. you, you just don't know what to expect. Everything that could go wrong might, <laughs> and you never Absolutely. know, you never know. And it's so true. You've got to learn to pivot. You've got to learn to deal with the unexpected. And sometimes even your best witnesses will fall apart and you've got to be able to try to pick them up <laughs> without leading. <laughs> Definitely. I mean, if, and if you go, in, if you go into every case with the same foundation. I'm going to work harder than anyone on the planet and know this case better than anyone. That's a great foundation, you know, and a standard to set. Right. And that's what you have to do. You need to know every single page of, of the, the chart, know all of the evidence, go to court, look at your subpoenaed records mm -hmm. um, and start using trial technology, which is also my thing and has been probably the single greatest tool especially for a young attorney to prepare and present evidence in court. Um, especially- What technology are you using? I'm just curious if you can explain to our viewers. Sure, sure. So when I'm talking about trial technology, I'm talking about using a computer software, bringing in your laptop to court with a projector, a dedicated projector, uh, and bring your own portable uh, projector screen. Mm -hmm. I have some other toys that, that I'll bring um, but that's really it. That's the basics. Okay. This is a few uh, softwares out there. Mm -hmm. There's trial director, which a, a lot of people have heard of a less known software, which has been my secret weapon is called exhibit view, which <laughs> I find uh, not a lot of people know about for whatever reason, it never really, you know, blew up like, like trial director did, mm -hmm. but for someone who's using a PC, it's only for PCs it's hands down the best and easiest software to, to handle in order to present evidence and make everything demonstrative. You know, I, I had, um, uh, sorry to kind of go on a tangent, but- I love it, let's go. <laughs> you know, when, when I was um, uh, maybe, I had done a bunch of trials and I saw what was happening. I saw that my presentation was kind of lacking. 
right? Mm -hmm. And I was doing the same thing everyone was doing, getting paying for the huge cardboard blowups. I'll never, I'll never forget. Hold on. Sorry. You're fine. <laughs> Duty calls all the time. You know, I'll we never, never forget. It was like the worst day of my life. I had a trial. I had like 10 of these huge blowups and it was pouring raining that day. I took the subway into, into court and my whole thing thing got soaked and destroyed it was like the worst worst thing and not to mention it was like a thousand dollars for all these these huge blow-ups so i'm like i need to make a change and I, I went to a cle in at the new york state trial lawyers association which in new york you're going to see the best most most cutting edge trial attorneys mm -hmm. and there was an attorney martin edelman who i'll never forget gave a presentation on, on demonstrative evidence and the one thing that he said stuck out forever to me. And it was, it, he started with a question. Okay. He's talking about presenting in court mm -hmm. and he asked everyone, what does everyone love? What do all jurors love? And he went around the room and he asked people, you know, people said, oh, they love their family. They love sports, you know, yada, yada, yada. He said, no. And it was like, he was looking right at me. Okay? <laughs> he, he said, what everyone loves is television. Oh TV. yeah, absolutely. What everyone loves. And for me, that was like the, the epiphany where it just clicked. And I set on a path at that time to kind of experiment with that tried trial director. I tried sanction was another one that was, I'm not sure mm -hmm. if that's around anymore. Mm -hmm. And I came across exhibit view uh, and actually became very close with the, the, uh, the owners and uh, just absolutely loved it. Um, it's also, it happens to be great for virtual stuff too, because you can present your evidence uh, on the fly virtually too. It's, it's awesome. And what it essentially, it, it's very simple. You just scan in all of your records and you can compare and contrast stuff. You can blow it up, highlight it, circle it, draw all on the fly. Right. So, you know, it moves more at the speed of thought, mm -hmm. you, you know, instead of being locked in, I have one you know, big blow up. I'm stuck with that. What What if the expert, you know, talks about something on another page in the chart and I don't have that page blown up? I'm, I'm screwed. Right. You know, right. or another page of, you know, brings up something, you know, um, unexpected. Mm -hmm. um, it allows you, if you know your case and you have a great outline, there's nowhere to run. You know, mm -hmm. you can pull up anything in a second. And it's so impactful mm -hmm. for people to not only hear it, but to also see it. Okay? Right. Right. Um, and also the fact that when you come in with a huge presentation set up, just the fact that you're doing that adds to credibility in your case. And the vast majority of other attorneys do not use this stuff. Right. Um, right. So, yeah, so. That's, it's, it's really interesting, too, because I, I I mean, we're all, you know, going through law school, uh, I think you know, reading something is different than reading and seeing it, right? It, it adds so much more when you're even learning. So yeah. when we're presenting to a jury, we're kind of teaching them about the case. And so by showing a demonstrative, especially one in real time where you can circle, whether it's on the Elmo or like you said, on your exhibits, yeah. it, it's a really cool tool because jurors, I think, are more receptive to real time, like you said, television almost. Yeah, uh, that, that's the one, that's the one, um, you know, response. I always try to, you know, talk to my jurors a after every case, right? No, no matter what. Um, and that's the one consistent thing they always say to me, Miss Newman, I loved your pre your presentation. Mm -hmm. Okay. You, you know, the when, when you're talking about an accident or some horrible event that happened to someone, it doesn't really become real to the jury unless they feel it, unless they see it, unless they're exposed to it in multiple different ways, not just you know, per se, the, the spoken word. Right. So that's why it kind of brings everything together and makes it much more vivid for them. Um, so that's, that's why I find Absolutely. it great. Absolutely. Well, and also another interesting aspect of, you know, medical malpractice is you, you already said you're dealing with medical records, doctor testimonies, uh, which I'm sure can get so complex. How do you prepare experts to break that down for a juror uh, or a, a, you know, a complete jury of people who may not have any experience in medical terminology? The first thing I would always say to an expert is explain this area of medicine, what, you know, the injury, the surgery that was performed, how you treated this infection. Talk to the jury just like you would talk to a patient, mm -hmm. because for the most part, you know, med medical, uh, you know, doctors who, who come in as experts, they're all in practice. Mm -hmm. 
Right. Um, so that's really how I, I approach it with them. I love an expert who is more like professorial that can really, really knows how to explain things. And there's certain experts that are fantastic at that. And then, you know, you might find very high priced experts with fantastic credentials that just aren't good at that, that might talk over people that might be way too complex um, for people really to understand because really you're using that expert in order to teach the jury. And that really, when I have the defendant's witnesses up and I'm crossing them or the defendant themselves in a, in a medical malpractice case, I use them to teach the jury. I'm teaching what medicine I want them to know through that witness as well. Right. You know? So, th so right. that's the angle. Uh, I think that's very effective. And how long does it take you to prep a witness? Let's start with maybe your, your, your client. How long does it take you to prep your client? And then let's go to like experts. How long do you prepare for a trial? Uh, uh, so clients, I, I'll prep for probably a few, a few months at least, multiple times, probably, you know, uh, probably five, six times at least. Um, you know, the good thing in, in our practice is that, you know, we're relatively small. There's three attorneys here and, you know, our staff. So we're really hands-on on most of the cases. I, I'm, I'm involved in all of our medical malpractice cases from its inception. So um, I think, you know, it's important also for any a trial attorney, especially, who's representing someone in court with a catastrophic injury to go to their house, sit down with their family, and understand where that person came from, you know, what their family life is like, you know, maybe they, they immigrated here, or they're, you know, children of immigrants, and the struggles that they had, it really helps you to talk about them, and what they've gone through in a more passionate way, a more empathetic way, and I think more, more effective, and you'll be amazed at some of the incredible things that you find out about people in their own journeys in life, and using that to show how big of an impact, you know, an accident or a serious injury is. Because, right. you know, unless you can show how, how much of a profound difference, you know, these injuries have made in someone's life in ways that other people can, can relate to, um, you know, I think that that is always a goal, goal there. So I spend a lot of time, time with my clients. Um, you know, I try to do day in the life videos as much as I can. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've had cases, uh, one case in particular, where I literally was like, I like slept over the apartment to do this day in the life video. <laughs> That's amazing. Because uh, this, this was a case with a profoundly brain damaged uh, mm -hmm. baby, uh, oh. who was at the time when we did this about six years old. Um, and there was so much that was involved in this kid's care um, that I just really wanted to be, you know, exposed to it as much as I can, not just as an attorney, but, you know, just a, a person. Right, right. And, and how receptive are clients to that kind of exposure, you know, for, to you as the attorney, are they pretty receptive or is there some pushback into you wanting to spend that kind of time or understand? Uh, I think it depends. I mean, there's, you know, you're always going to get people with pushback, but right. you just can't let them, you know, you right. have to, you, you have to let them know this is the most important thing. If people will, will appreciate it, you know, for the most part. And nowadays with Zoom, I mean, it's so easy to hop on a call with someone and just talk, you know, I might not prep them fully, you know, do a dress rehearsal, you know, each time, but talk about specific issues, get their wheels spinning so that they know what to expect. Right. And, you know, to kind of tailor their the meat and potatoes of their of their testimony so that they get out all of the good stuff that you really want to be told in court. Right. Know? Absolutely. Yeah. And when you are doing these cases, I mean, I know that the past few years have put a lot of courts behind on trial schedule. Oh. What has oh, your, your trial schedule been like? Has it been pushed back years or months or what does it look like for you? Oh, it's, it's a completely different world. Um, I, we, I like joke around. I, I like needed a break after like 12 years straight, nonstop <laughs> trials. You know, uh, there were years I tried like 12, 13 cases in a year, which is a lot of, you know, it, it was a lot. That is so a lot. <laughs> uh, I had a little, per my, my wife, actually, she was diagnosed with stage four cancer, oh, uh, right before the pandemic she's totally fine now she, she's oh, great I'm so glad. I'm so remission glad. but after that and a crazy busy year and then the pandemic it was kind of like a nice 
little break almost, but at the same time, after a few months, you know, you're ready to get back into court. But uh, and, and my point being in New York, you know, they basically shut the courts down for about seven to nine months, totally. Right. Um, where there was no jury trials, nothing. Uh, now, you know, you're talking huge venues where I practice in the Bronx, primarily in Brooklyn in Manhattan Supreme, you know, these are huge venues with millions and millions of residents, you know, that live in these, in these uh, counties. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe there's three, four cases that are getting sent out for trial a day, whereas opposed there might be dozens before. So the backlog is, is huge. This summer, I have a lot of, uh, of trials lined up and that, it seems like they're more, more, um, you know, trying to push them out. Right. But we'll see, you know, we'll see. Yeah. It's, it, it seems a day-to-day -day thing. And I mean, at least for my schedule, sometimes I'm like, wow, are we talking years out for a uh, ready by trial day? Yeah, <laughs> I, <laughs> it's really far out. <laughs> yeah. So I, I will tell you in the, in the two years since the, this is like literally two years to the day that we're, to the, this is right, right when, right before the hammer came down right. uh, two years ago, uh, over this time, I, I've tried, I think three cases to verdict that, wow. uh, you know, full, and they were for the most part, smaller trials. Right. Um, one was like a trucking case and two other motor vehicle cases. I will say, though, you know, despite all of it and despite having to wait in line, wear a mask, you know, sit behind plexiglass, which is how they have these these courtrooms set up in in, in New York. Jurors were great. Uh, okay. I have to say these people were awesome coming okay. in, despite being through, you know, really tough times. A lot of people. Right. You know. Still willing to do their civic duty and sit totally. there and listen to the facts and, <laughs> and law and, and make it a turn. <laughs> watch me sweat through this mess. Right. Uh, I will. Right. I will say another thing, you know, as far as the trial tech stuff goes, is that that has been at least for the, the limited work that I've done in, in, in court during the pandemic has been incredible, both virtual and in court. Um, that people really love because, you know, now you t you're putting a mask on someone. So it's that much more difficult to, to kind of see someone's emotions and right. gauge a witness and, you know, you know, make these determinations that people instinctively do just based on facial expressions. So it adds an, and also the plexiglass element. I did a trial. I was like 30 feet away from the jury, you know, and, and what I ended up doing is I, this projector that I have, it's, it's called, a, it's a long throw projector, which basically means it, it, it's so bright that you could light it up in like the brightest of conditions and you could still right. see it. And, and so it, there was a huge white wall in the courtroom and I just blew up the entire wall, like, like a movie yeah. theater. Very you know, cool. Very which cool. It, which was was great. That you know, just kind of uh, you got to be flexible, you, you know, and kind of figure out what the best, most effective thing is. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, did you ever imagine thirteen years ago you'd be litigating wearing a mask? <laughs> no. no. I, I'm I so happy though. In New York, that they're, they're lifting the the mask, uh, you know, mandate for the little kids. I have a five year old. So right. that's happening actually tomorrow and it's my son's birthday this weekend. So oh, I'm, I'm so, so excited. Yeah, that's exciting. OK, so how what's it like being a dad and a litigator? I mean, how do you balance home life with a five year old and, you know, your wife? And it, how, how do you balance that with being a trial lawyer? Because litigators, you know, we live and die by scheduling orders, always busy. What, what do you do to handle that? <laughs> uh, I think uh, the first thing is I, I put away the phone when, I, when I'm home. You know, I get home, uh, I, you know, usually around six o'clock, you know, uh, unless I'm working like crazy and I'm, you know, in the middle of something that, that, that's late. I do a lot of work at home too, like late night, my thoughts, you, you know, that type of stuff, mm -hmm. eight o'clock after. But, you know, for the two hours that, you know, dinner and, and bedtime and bath and all that, you know, I'm just tuned out from everything else except, you know, family time. That's a great. And I think, you know, as kids get older, they, they kind of, it's, it's crazy that they start asking you questions about what you do. My, and my son's asking me, what, what cases did you work on today, daddy? You, you know, he uh, doesn't really even understand the concept yet, but um, you know, it, it's, um, it's just a journey. It's part, part of the journey. You know, you might be building the fourth generation there of <laughs> the law firm. So you never know. He'll probably be Maybe. so interested. He'll want to be a lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> And what yeah. will you tell him if he's like, dad, I want to be a lawyer. <laughs> I, I would tell him, you know, uh, the same thing that my dad and my grandfather told me, if, it, if, if that's something that, you know, you think, you know, motivates you and, and that you could find, you know, passion in and, and be happy, then, then go for it. You know, I, I'm, it's in his blood. So, you know, 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, it sounds like both sides. You've got lawyers. So, yeah. you know, he's got it coming from both sides. He's probably going to be a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Kyle, it's been so great to talk to you. And I would love to yeah. end if you've got a really cool story you don't mind sharing with us about a case or a couple of cases where you had a great result or a great client story. We'd love to end with something that's uh, kind of fun for the viewers to hear a war story, if you will. <laughs> uh, uh, let's see. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll tell the story of my first trial ever. Perfect. Okay. Uh, my first trial was a, it was a, a tax, it was a pedestrian knockdown uh, involving a taxi. Oh, okay? wow. Uh, and, and in New York, there's a hundred thousand dollar policy. Um, and I, you know, I wanted the policy. It was a knee surgery case. I was so amped up for my first trial. So uh, the opening statement starts. Okay. And I'm reenacting the, the, the collision where my client was. I'm kind of like all over the place, flailing my body and i didn't see it at the time but the they have these like wheelie carts in this this in new york county where they bring in all the the subpoenaed records so as i'm going through my whole thing i knock backwards over the cart and it was like the entire <laughs> evidence like exploded in the courtroom okay and you could imagine how mortified i was um you know sweating red in the face you know <laughs> Um, but at the end of the day, I think what that taught me is no matter what case it is, just be passionate about it. If right. you are, you know, vanilla and you show no real emotion and investment in your case and your client, people aren't going to side with you. Absolutely. You need to find a way. You might not like every client or every case, but you need to find some common ground where you can get passionate about it. Not let it, you know, completely you know, go nuts. But, right. but um, I, th I find that that is important, at least for me. Absolutely. I mean, at the end of the day, I think litigators were storytellers. We tell stories absolutely. and totally. you know, not fictional stories, but we're telling real stories, people's stories. Right. And absolutely. You've got to be engaging or otherwise you're going to put that jury right to sleep. And I've seen yeah, that happen. Right to sleep. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you have too with medical. Oh, I've, oh, oh yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah. You'd be amazed at what the, the things that jurors that you thought were on your side that loved you could hate you and vice versa. People that you thought didn't like you at all were your biggest champion. Exactly. So you never know what you're going to get with the jury. That's kind of the excitement. It's that jury selection is the one thing I will never master or come close <laughs> to. Uh, but you know, you got to try. You do. Absolutely. Well, Kyle, it's been so great talking to you. Yeah, you and too. I would love if you would tell all of the viewers where they can find you on social media so they can follow your accounts and your firm. Sure. If you don't mind. Sure. So my Instagram is Kyle new ESQ. Check it out. Um, and uh, I have my YouTube channel uh, for my law firm as well. And uh, I got some other cool stuff coming out soon. So uh, definitely check me out. <laughs> well, we'll be following closely. And Kyle, thanks again. And thank that you, everybody, for watching Lawyer Interviews. This is Reggie. Have a great day. Thanks, Reggie.